Well, I invite you to uh, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. We're going to hear tonight a story of Jesus, a parable of Jesus. There's something wonderful about stories because they're just sort of simple and sweet when they're told well, and nobody told stories better than Jesus. Uh, when they're to- told well, they lock in our minds, they lock in our hearts, and they begin to transform our lives. So I invite you to listen to what God has to say through this parable today. And I, I want you to kind of see and feel what's happening, see and feel uh, the conflict, uh, listen to the power of, of this one simple story found in Luke chapter 10. It begins in verse 25. And I want you to get the sense of the moment, what's going on, because it's not just Jesus saying, let me tell you a story. It's something going on that causes Jesus to say, oh, what's the right story for this moment, for this situation? So in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, we read these words. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So we know what's going on already. This religious professional is coming and his goal is to test Jesus. He wants to prove him wrong. He wants to to cause him to trip and stumble in some way. So on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How do you find your way to heaven? Good question. Verse 26, Jesus responds, well, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? You're a religious professional. You're you're, you're a keeper of the law. This is not of the the political law. This is of the religious law. All right? He says, so you're a professional. How do you read it? And here, now, now watch what happens. The lawyer answers perfectly. It's a perfect response. Here's what he says. The lawyer answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the perfect answer. He knows his, he knows what to say. So he he gives a great answer. And how does Jesus respond? He says, You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live. Love God with all that's in you. Love your neighbor as yourself. But remember, this man was not coming to Jesus to learn the truth. What was he coming for? To mess with him. He was coming to prove Jesus wrong, to, to cause him to stumble. And now Jesus said, good answer. The whole story could end right there. It could end right there. Jesus says in verse 20, you've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. End of story. But it's not over yet. The lawyer speaks next. But he wanted to justify himself. Every time you're feeling like you have to justify yourself, be careful. All right? He, 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 he didn't want to learn from Jesus. He didn't want to talk about the truth with Jesus. He wanted to test him. And now he wants to justify himself. His motives matter. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? There were actually rabbis in those days that said, if a sinner falls and hurts themselves, don't hurt him. If a sinner's in a difficult time, let him go. So he says, well, who's my neighbor? He's trying to justify himself. That's when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, the Good Samaritan is a somewhat familiar story. It's one you've probably heard before. If you haven't, you're going to hear it tonight because I'm going to read the whole thing. All right? But, But it's so familiar that we actually have laws called Good Samaritan Laws. Meaning when you come across someone who's injured or hurting, if you ignore them and don't help them, you could actually be in trouble for not helping. You know where that came from? This story. It's a story that's been around for a long time and it's kind of found its way into people's hearts and even into laws, all right? So he wanted to justify himself. He asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, here's where we pick up the story. So now we're in verse 30. And what we've done is we've got the setting. Now, now, and this, no, so here Jesus is talking. The lawyer's there. Other people are listening. He gives the right answer, but he wants to justify himself. Well, who's my neighbor? Now Jesus is telling this story for that moment. Everybody follow? This is why he's, Jesus is telling the story. So here's the story. Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, about a 17 miles of treacherous highway, where there were lots of robberies, lots of muggings, not a good neighborhood, from, on that road down there, Okay. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. Not uncommon. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Got the picture? Guy's traveling, he's mugged, he's robbed, he's stripped, he's left on the road dead. 
for half dead, almost dead. Now a priest happened to be going down that same road. This is when people would say, oh, a priest, a good, one of the good guys. You know, one of the people who cared about people, compassion. A priest happened to be going down that same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. We've all done it. Every one of us. See somebody, see a need, running late. See something, don't want to mess with it. It's happened to all of us. When you see something, you go, I could stop and help, but for whatever reason we have. Well, this priest comes along, and as Jesus is telling this story, people see it, hear a priest and think, oh, a good guy. But this priest crosses on the other side. So too, a Levite. A Levite was from a certain family, a priestly family. So it's another religious leader. So religious leader number one, strike one. Religious leader number two should be helping out, should be noticing, have compassion. But, but the Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, he saw the man, when he came to the place and he saw that him, he passed by on the other side. He goes around the problem and just keeps on going. Jesus is just telling a story to this lawyer who's listening and Jesus is in some ways taking the script and turning it upside down because he says there's a good guy. He doesn't do the right thing. There's another good guy. He doesn't do the right thing. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. You have to understand, in the first century, in the mind of, of the people that Jesus is speaking to, the priest is the good guy, the Levite's the good guy. The Samaritan is the bad guy. Other side of the tracks half-breed. The Jewish people so despise the Samaritans because of a lot of historical rifts and conflicts and battles that had happened that if they, walk, if they had to walk through Samaria, they avoided even walking in Samaria because they didn't want the dust of Samaria on their feet because it would make them feel unclean. Even dirt from Samaria was somehow dirtier. So if they went through Samaria, they would actually wash themselves afterwards just to get Samaria off of them. Right? But now Jesus says, priest, strike one. Levite, strike two. Good guy, nope. Good guy, nope. But a Samaritan, the one that all those people would have thought, oh, here's the bad guy. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw him, they all saw him. But he saw him. You know the difference? Sometimes you see and you move on. Sometimes you see and you let the grace of Jesus come through a kind of a crack in your heart and in your schedule, and all of a sudden you see. It's not the same as when you just saw and walked away. Something happened. The Samaritan saw him. He took pity on him. His heart went out to him. He went to him. He didn't walk around him. He went to him. And he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. These are expensive things. He pours on oil and wine. Then he put this man, this broken man, half dead, on his own donkey. And he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him, personally engaged. He took care of him. Verse 35, the next day, so he takes care of this guy throughout the night. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, enough money to pay for the immediate needs. All right? He gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense you may have had. Blank check. Here's enough money for now. When I come back, if he didn't get better by the time, you know, then, then I'll cover whatever the cost. Remember, this is a story. But he's telling it to this lawyer who's trying to justify himself, who's trying to trip Jesus up. Well, who is my neighbor? And this is the story Jesus tells he finishes the story, and Jesus looks at the lawyer, and he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Not a complicated question. Let me ask you, okay, here's your options. Ready? Ready? The priest who walked around, the Levite who walked around, or the Samaritan who stopped and helped and gave and cared and counted the cost and said, when I come back, I'll pay some more. So you tell me, the priest, the lady, or the Samaritan, who was the neighbor? Samaritan. But that's not what the guy says. Watch what happens. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell among the hands of the robbers? Simple question. What does he say? The expert in the law, law replied, the one who had mercy on him. 
What word did he not use? Samaritan. He didn't even want it on his lips. Jesus takes everything you'd expect. And he flips it upside down. Because this man is saying, I already know I'm righteous. I already know I'm good. I'm trying to justify myself. I'm trying to trip you up. And Jesus wants to take this guy and break through. I don't think when Jesus, in moments like this, confronted somebody, it was like this mean-spirited hatred. I think Jesus wanted him to understand. Stop justifying yourself. Stop trying to trip me up. Just listen. Let the God of heaven who came to this world in human flesh show you what life is really about. Because you've got all kinds of religion, but you don't have it right. So he's taking all the characters that should be the heroes. Jesus makes them the villains. He's taking the character that they would think of as the villain, and he makes them the hero. The expert in the law replied, wouldn't say Samaritan, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and be like the Samaritan. You go and do likewise. You go live like the Samaritan lived. And you'll find out what a neighbor is and how a neighbor behaves and who your neighbor is. And you'll find out if you are a neighbor. Are you the one that walks around the situation? Are you the one who walks into the situation? Now, there's a lot to be learned here. And in our nights of worship, what we're really trying to do is just say, God, what is the, what is the central message? What are you trying to speak to my heart? As I was doing some study on this, I, I was reading in a commentary. It's called, you'll see on the screen, it's called NIVAC, New International Version Application Commentary Series. But on the Gospel of Luke, the, the writer of that commentary says this. I think this is a profound thought. Ethics is not a matter of abstract reflection on certain situations. You know, what is ethics? Well, I can explain to you how to behave and I can explain everything to you. Ethics is not an abstract reflection on certain situations. It is a reflection of character that combines listening to God in a way that leads to sensitive service to people. Am I an ethical person? Well, I can explain what's ethical. No, what he's saying is no, no. If you listen to God and act on what he calls you to do, th th this Samaritan was the ethical one in the group. Why? Because he, he responded in a way that would honor God. And the religious leaders in the story are really just sort of side notes. It's the Samaritan that we focus on. So I have a question for you tonight. Who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Who's your neighbor? And are you a neighbor to them? Do you not only know who your neighbor is, but do you know in the story of your life, as your story unfolds, as your story is being told, are, who are you in the story? Because Jesus finishes by saying to this lawyer, you go and do likewise. And, and so I would ask the question, what, what does he mean, go and do likewise? What does it mean to be neighborly? What does it mean to live like Jesus? And I want to give you just four little thoughts that you can lock in your heart and lock in your mind. And, and maybe ask the question, the next time I encounter a moment where I can respond to a need or to someone else, how will I respond? Here's what we see in the story. We see that first, the Samaritan, he could see. They all saw the man, but only one of them saw him. He noticed, he saw, but, but he didn't just see and avoid. So the first thing, as you walk through your life, do you see? Do you see the needs around you? Now, I know the answer to that most of the time. We almost always see them. The question is, do we see them? Do we pause and really pay attention? And then, to feel, to engage. Do we have compassion? The Samaritan, the bad guy in the story, he saw, he noticed what was going on, and he felt something. I have this sense that these a couple of years of COVID, these couple of years of spending probably too much time in front of devices watching entertainment, we, we, we've seen so many acts of violence portrayed on the TV, not real, just played out, just in shows. We've, we see that, that when, when real violence happens, it doesn't even compute. I remember one of our sons went to school in Chicago, 
And he said one day he was on the L, on the elevated train, going through a town. He was actually going to a Bible school, so he was going to kind of every, every week he would go to this one area and do ministry, and he was, was part of their education, was also doing ministry, so he was going to this kind of rougher neighborhood. He's, dry, he's on the L, he's looking out the window, he, out the window he sees this big lit playground. And there's these two groups of guys coming at each other with like knives and chains and guns, and they start fighting and start shooting, and he's watching this, and he, when he told us about it, he said, I was watching it out the window of the train, and it, at first, I had to say, this isn't a show. This isn't a TV show. This isn't a movie. These are real people. He, he said it was just, it was so, it wasn't something he expected to see, but it's almost, it's almost possible to go through our lives, and when we see real violence, the other day, uh, I saw some footage of what's been happening in, the, in Ukraine. And they went to this one town and they were talking about what happened. And at that moment, you know, in those moments, we have to decide, do I see or do I really see? And will I let myself have compassion? Can I let you know a little secret? Most situations in life, it's easier not to feel. It's easier just to keep at arm's length and move on. Because if you feel, you might have to do what the Samaritan did. You might have to stop and do something. But it's always better to see and notice and then to feel and let God get into your heart and then engage. In this story, the Samaritan would saw what was happening. He felt something, and then he acted. He helped in practical ways. He stopped some oil, some wine, some kind of healing medicine. Put the person on the donkey, bring him to the inn. Stayed overnight taking care of this person who he had never met before. Jesus is painting a picture to lock it in our hearts and our minds. Not just the lawyer then, but the lawyer that lives in our hearts sometimes. The one who sits to justify ourselves, but doesn't want to stop and help. There's a little bit of that lawyer in every one of our souls at different times if we're not careful. And so, so Jesus says, this guy acts, he does something. And then the final thing is he sacrifices, he takes a risk. He says, when I come back, whatever the bill is, I got it. Take care of him, and I'll cover it. In a few moments, we're going to come to this table and we're going to partake of the bread. We're going to drink from the cup and we're going to think about Jesus. Can I suggest to you, as we prepare to come to the table, that this is the way that Jesus and his work on the cross fit together? This is, this is the way of Jesus. Think about Jesus looking at you in your brokenness in your lostness, in your sin. If you're already a Christian or if you're not yet a Christian, when Jesus looks upon us, he sees us. He sees us. When I was a 15-year-old surf punk living down at Huntington Beach who cared about nobody but myself, Jesus saw me half dead in the road. He knew me by name. And the, the one who made the heavens and the earth looked at you and looked at me in our brokenness and our lostness on the edge of death spiritually and he saw you. Do you recognize that? If you're a Christian. In a moment when you hold the bread and hold the cup, do you recognize that the one who died on the cross saw you in your worst and loved you anyways? So he saw you and then Jesus felt something. He let himself feel. He loved you. While we were still sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. In the midst of our sin, he loved us already. He gave his life for us. So Jesus saw you, and then Jesus loved you enough to leave the glory of heaven. So Jesus, third, he came for you. Like the, like the Samaritan on the road with that man, Jesus saw us in our brokenness. He didn't walk around us. He didn't avoid you. He, was, he didn't despise you. He knew all your sins. He saw it, and he loved you. He loved me in our brokenness. And so when, out of his love, he came. He stopped. He began to care for us. And then Jesus died for you. He paid the price. He took your sins. And he didn't cover half the cost or 94% of the cost or 98.9% .9 of the cost. Jesus paid it all. There's an old hymn. If you grew up in the church, you might say, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. You know, sin had left a crimson stain, the red of our sins, but he washed it white as snow. He washed it all away. And then Jesus says, now you go and do likewise. Live like me. Do you know what it means to be a, a Christian? 
It's not that complicated. It's just becoming more and more like Jesus every day. The first Christians were called Christians, because they were, which, which the term sort of meant little Christ. It's like people were mocking them. Oh, you're trying to be like little Jesuses. And it was a, it was a term to mock people. And the Christians were like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. We're just, trying, we're just trying to be like the one who loved us. So as you come to the table, and as you walk through this coming week, will you remember that Jesus saw you and loved you and came for you and gave himself for you? And will you see people and let your heart feel and take some action and count the cost and watch the presence of Jesus move through this community? And if you're out of the area, wherever you are, you can bring the presence of Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. That we would recognize that you look upon us. That you know us. Everything about us. That you gave your life for us on the cross. So Jesus, we quiet our hearts right now. As we prepare to remember you. Your body broken. Your blood shed. The price paid. That Jesus, you came to us in our brokenness. You wrapped your arms around us. You breathed life back into our lungs. You loved us with an everlasting love. And as we partake tonight, bring that moment back to our hearts. I pray that each one of us would be able to remember the moment that we first understood I am loved by Jesus. I'm cleansed by his grace. He has made me his beloved daughter. He has called me his precious son. Just quiet your heart. Remember that moment. And if there's a chance that you have not had that moment come in your life yet, would you just quietly say to Jesus, Jesus, if you love me that much, if you could put me back together and heal and restore me, Jesus, my heart's open. And if that's you tonight, I ask you before you leave here tonight, just come and talk to me or my wife, Sherry. Just say, hey, I want to talk about receiving this Jesus who gave his life for me. If you're online, you can call in during the prayer time and the phone number there for prayer and, and you can say, I want to know Jesus. Whoever's talking to you, they'll be able to talk to you about that. Let's keep our hearts quiet before the Lord as we prepare to come to the table. And I want to read from, from Isaiah 53. If you have your little communion cup, if you would just take the, take the cup and the side that has the, the wafer in it, just peel that off and take the wafer and just hold it in your hand. And then take the other side, turn it, then turn it over first, please, and then uh, peel off the other side with the juice upward. And, and so you'll have the wafer in one hand and the cup in the other hand. And as I read this passage, would you just listen to these words, remembering what Jesus did for you? If you're at home, if you're online somewhere, and if you can find some juice and a cracker, something for communion, uh, would you get those items and hold those in your hands as I read this from Isaiah 53? 700 years before Jesus was born. In a prophetic Holy Spirit word, Isaiah wrote these words about Jesus who would come seven centuries later. These are words prophesying Jesus the Messiah. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He, the coming Messiah, Jesus, was despised and rejected by all people. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we, people, held him in low esteem. Listen to these words as you hold the cup, as you hold the bread. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him 
punished by God, stricken by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep, we've gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him all of our iniquities, all of our sins. As you hold the bread in your hand, as you look at the wafer, remember that at that table, at the Last Supper, before he went to the cross to be broken for us, Jesus said, take this bread, broken for you. And every time you partake of it, he said, do this in remembrance of me. You just hold the wafer in front of you so you can see it. And before you partake, you just remember that even as that will be crushed between your teeth in a moment, he was crushed for your sins. He was broken for your iniquities. And the price that he took was ours. And he delighted to take it because he saw you on the side of the road. He saw you and he came to you in love. He put his arms around you. He breathed life into you. He ministered to you. And he said, the whole price, whatever it costs, you're mine. Partake of the bread and remember Jesus. At that same table, Jesus took the cup So this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you partake of it, Jesus said, remember me. As you look at the cup, a reminder of his bloodshed. Will you remember that when Jesus saw you, he couldn't and wouldn't pass by. He washed you clean. As you remember this cup, remember that Jesus' price to cleanse you and give you life was his own life. And you were washed clean because his blood was shed. The book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He has had mercy on us. So partake of the cup and remember the price Jesus paid.